Hello and welcome to the Origins of Islam. Today we want to continue where we left off last time and talk about the Quran. But today we will look into the syro aramaic reading of the Quran, the approach that Christoph Luxemburg developed. Let's go through his methodology step by step. Christoph Luxemburg started with the so-called dark passages. We talked about that last time. These are the passages which are obscure and difficult, if not impossible, to understand or to interpret. And what he did is he developed this seven-step approach, which you can see here. Step one is to check with the tafsir. So that's the commentary on the Quran itself, and particularly with Al-Tabari, who is generally regarded to be the most important commentator on the Quran. And what Tabari did was to compile all attempts at interpreting any Quranic verse, and then in the end give his own opinion. And regarding those dark passages, his opinion usually was, nobody knows. But before, <laughs> before he gives his opinion, there are all the other opinions by other scholars. What Luxembourg did was to check with those opinions and see if any of them actually makes sense. But usually it doesn't. So this is very rare that he found something in the tradition that makes more sense than what is commonly transported today. If however Luxburg did find anything, then it would be over at this point. Only if he doesn't find something, he goes to the next step. So in this case, the next step would be to check with the Lisan al-Arab for other possible semantic meanings. So what's the Lisan al-Arab? That's one of the oldest dictionaries of the Arabic language and also one of the most extensive ones. However, it is later than Al-Tabari. So Luxembourg's rationale was that since Al-Tabari didn't have a dictionary like the Lisan al-Arab, it's possible that he overlooked some obscure meanings or definitions for certain words. If any of those alternative interpretations of words that are listed in the Lisan al-Arab makes more sense or leads to an understandable interpretation of the verse in question, then it would be over at this point and we would move on. However, if, it, if Luxembourg still doesn't find anything, which he usually didn't at this point, then he would move on to the next step. And this is where it really gets interesting. Because now in step three, he assumes that the word we're looking at is actually not an Arabic word, but an Aramaic one. So he checks for a homonymous root in Aramaic with a different meaning than the Arabic word. And what Luxembourg says is that in a significant amount of cases, this actually resulted in an improved understanding of the verse in question, which would mean then again at this point that it would be over and he would go with that interpretation. However, often enough, it didn't result in any improved understanding, in which case he would go on to step number four. Now he would be back to assuming that the word in question is Arabic in nature. However, the assumption now would be that the diacritics are wrong. So those are the little dots. And now he would move them around and see what other words he could find in there. And very often he said it's apparent that the Arab readers misread the proper Arab word and added wrong diacritics, in which case it would be over. But often enough, he doesn't find anything either. Then he would go on to step number five. And once again, now he would assume that we're looking at an Aramaic word. But now he's doing the same thing he did in step three. He plays around with diacritics, but now on the Aramaic side of things. And here he says, this step has led to countless successful results, provided that the Aramaic expression gives the larger context a logical meaning. But if he still didn't find anything, he would go on to step number six. And this time, again, he would assume that the word is Arabic, but a lost Arabic word. At this point, he would try to retranslate the presumably Arabic word back into Aramaic by inferring the semantics of the Syro-Aramaic word. So what that means is the word he is looking at is probably a, a word that has been lost in the Arabic language. But since there are systematic rules between Arabic and Aramaic, one can try to infer how the Aramaic word would look like that corresponds to the Arabic word in the text. And he says that this is the most important, most extensive, but also the most difficult step because we're moving into completely uncharted territory here. And you really need a very good grasp of both Arabic and Aramaic. But sometimes he still didn't find anything here. So in that case, he would now look into 10th century lexicons, which were used as translation aids for people who would translate old Aramaic texts into Arabic. Because by the 10th century, the Aramaic language was slowly dying out, which had to do with the Arabization policy in the Caliphate. So whereas before, 
A lot of important, particularly scientific texts were written in Aramaic. Now, a lot of people couldn't understand them anymore, so they had to be translated into Arabic. And for that purpose, lexicons were created. And in those lexicons, one can find Arabic definitions for zero aramaic words, which can then again help to understand what the Quran actually meant. By this point, hopefully, we have found the proper meaning of the verse we're looking at. Now, this is, of course, still a bit abstract. So let's go through this by looking at an example. And the example we're looking at is, in this case, Surah 4454 and 52.20. It's the same verse in both instances. And here we are looking at the so-called Huris, the Paradise Virgins. You can see his methodology at work here. So what does this verse actually say? So in the classic interpretation, it says, We have married them with dark, white-eyed maidens. And them, in this case, are the saints or the believers who go into paradise. So once you reach paradise, you will be married with dark, white-eyed maidens. And in the Islamic tradition, I mean, it is believed that it's 72 of these dark, white-eyed maidens that the believers will be married to in paradise. Now, what Christoph Luxemburg says is that, in fact, this is wrong. And what the text really says is, we will make them comfortable under white crystalline grapes. So the question is, what is it? Are we looking at 72 virgins or 72 grapes? Now let's go through the traditional reasoning. So Muslims today will say that huris, or actually the proper term is hurin, literally means white eyes in Arabic. So hur is whites, so actually it's plural, whites, and in is eyes. And those words, they have feminine ending and they are plural, which would fit a description of women. Now, the next argument is these Huris will be married with the blessed men who enter paradise. And since you can only marry humans, we are obviously talking about women. The pronoun used in the context is she, or actually it's rather, it's they, but it's a gender they, something which doesn't exist in the English language. So that's why I'm using she here to visualize it, but it's technically a plural. Anyway, so she in Arabic can only denote a person. So you can't use that pronoun with animals or objects, only with human beings. In this case, women, because it's she. So again, clearly it's women who are being married to those men in paradise. But also there's obviously a larger context within the Quran. There are other verses who describe them as being virgins, for instance, or as being big-breasted. So again, this can only talk about women. Hence, it's women who are married to the blessed men in paradise. Which still leaves us with one puzzling thing, and it's why call them white eyes? It seems a bit odd. And particularly if you remember in the translation that I gave before, it actually said white dark-eyed maidens. How come they say dark-eyed now when it literally means white eyes? Well, that's actually an interpretation that's going into this translation. Because literally it only says hurin, which the Muslims say means white eyes. How do we arrive at that interpretation? interpretation with dark eyes. And that's not just a quirk of the translator that I've picked, that's actually believed to be what, what is meant here. And supposedly the eyes of the virgins are so big that you can see a lot of white in them, underlining the dark irises, which then is supposed to show how beautiful the Huris are, because big eyes are beautiful. But of course, it only ever says white in the Quran, it doesn't say dark, that's something that the interpreters bring to the text that's not in the text itself. Right, so what does Christoph Luxemburg answer to this? Now, he says that hurin technically means crystalline grapes when read in Aramaic. And now here we have to go into a little bit more detail. In Aramaic, white can refer to grapes. So what he's saying is that the Muslims have got the hur part right. Hur actually means white, both in Arabic and Aramaic. But in Aramaic, white can refer to grapes. And even in the Quran, for instance, when it talks about the wine in paradise, it describes it as white. And the point here is that everything in paradise is perfect. Right? It's absolutely pure. There are no contaminations. Everything is clean, crystalline, pure, perfect. So that's why it makes sense to use the term white also when describing things in paradise. I mean, particularly because it's already an established word for vines and wine and grapes, but especially for high quality grapes and, and vines and wine because of its purity, because it, the whiteness symbolizes purity. Where Christoph Luxemburg now differs with the traditional interpretation is the in part. So in, which in Arabic means eyes, can also mean crystalline in Aramaic or crystal-like, anything of that sort. And in fact, even in Arabic, you can, for instance, say the eye of somebody, and then that's somebody's esteem. 
it has the same origin, but the definition of crystalline for in that itself doesn't exist in Arabic anymore, but we can still see the remnants in Arabic. In Aramaic, it's still somewhat common in that time. This is one element of Luxembourg's um, approach, where he looks at Aramaic um, meanings for a word, in this case, in. Now, for the next part, we see a different element of his approach. Here, we see that without diacritics, the letters R and Z are the same in Arabic. And you can see them here within the brackets. You can see that the Z has a little dot on top of it, whereas the R doesn't. But that's the only difference. And as we've learned the last time, in the earliest manuscripts, there were no dots at all. So you can't tell if we're, if you're looking at an R or a Z. And Luxembourg argues that in this case, there was likely a mistake being made when those dots were added. In that verse, if you just change that one little dot, then instead of let them be married, it says let them rest. So <laughs> it's a big difference made possible only by the removal of this little dot. And now here Luxembourg goes into more detail. Now I'm only scratching the surface. Luxembourg makes, of course, a lot more arguments. He goes in, in very deep into grammar and all of that as well. Now, next part, the pronoun she can refer to animals or objects in Aramaic and indeed in the Quran itself. So there are other instances where this pronoun is used to address something other than a woman or a girl. So for example, in the Quran, there's a verse talking about the Pharaoh's cows who are also addressed as she, something that is possible in Aramaic, not in modern Arabic, but obviously in the Quran, it was also possible. And now again, going to the larger context, the word interpreted as virgin simply means first. And it, in fact, it's often used to denote the first fruits. That was obviously a very important concept um, back, back in those days where a lot depended upon uh, food production. So the first fruits in pagan times, they were typically offered as sacrifices to the gods. But even afterwards, first fruits were something very important. And that's why this is actually a very common term. When you look at dictionaries, typically the word definitions are given in a certain order. And that order is how common they are. So most often the word interpreted as virgins in this instance is used in the general language to mean first. Next, firstborn. And then in the third position, we already have first fruits. And virgins comes only quite a bit later. So virgin is a rare definition for this word. And it's always likelier that a more common definition is used. It's not definitive proof, obviously, but it fits into the larger picture here. And similarly, the word that is interpreted as meaning big-breasted Luxembourg says it just means lush. So again, lush grapes or vines, not big-breasted virgins. Therefore, Luxembourg argues we're obviously looking at grapes and not virgins. But also when you, when you think about this wide eye description, there's no language in the world, no culture at any point in time, which ever described beauty by referring to white eyes. When you want to describe some beautiful eyes, one typically says that, that the eyes are black or brown or blue or green, but never white. White is only used as a metaphor for blindness. And indeed, even the Quran, that's how it's used. Um, in Surah 1284, Jacob's eyes turn white for all of his crying, which means he turns blind, not beautiful. And it's also why the translators and the interpreters say beautiful black eyes or beautiful dark eyes in this verse, because it does make sense to call them beautiful white eyes. But the Quran clearly only says white. So at this point, it should be fairly clear that Luxembourg has a point and is likely correct. But there's more. And for that, we have to make a little detour and look at the guy in this picture here. That's Saint Ephraim the Syrian. He lived from 306 to 373. And he wrote Aramaic hymns about paradise. Um, very famous ones. Not only about paradise, he wrote hymns in general. But his paradise hymns were particularly famous. And they sort of spawned an entire genre. So these hymns about paradise, they really become very popular after him. But his ones in particular, they were so popular that they were translated into Greek and Armenian already during his lifetime, and then later also in all kinds of other languages. And lots of versions and variants exist. And the Quran is clearly inspired by his writings when describing paradise. There are many parallels. For example, in the very next sentence in the Quran, after, after the verse we looked at, the Huris are described as if they were pearls still in their shells. That sounds like it's straight from St. Ephraim, who has talked a lot about pearls as well in his hymns. He has an entire cycle about pearls, but also pearls in their shells means pearls without any contaminations, pristine, crystal-like, and that fits nicely with the, with the description of those paradise grapes. It's not so much a way of describing women.
And there are also other verses which are clearly inspired by St. Ephraim in Christoph Luxemburg's translation of Surah 7619, which is, to be fair, quite different once again from um, the way it's traditionally interpreted. But again, using his same approach, he translates Surah 7619 as iced fruits or grapes pass around among them. So once again, among the believers in paradise. To see them, you would think they were loose, dispersed pearls. Once again, this this pearl metaphor. And these grapes, they move around and offer themselves up to the believers in paradise, which is an image that we also see in one of Ephraim's hymn on paradise, where it says, the men who abstained with understanding from wine will the vines of paradise rush out to meet all the more joyfully as each one stretches out and proffers him its clusters. So again, we have this image of the grapes offering themselves up to the believers. And another important point to talk about is that in those days, grapes really were the prototypical fruits of paradise. And not just paradise, not just the heavenly paradise, but also earthly paradises. And for that, you need to remember that the word paradise technically simply means garden. And the Quran talks about many gardens, many earthly paradises, where it always talks about grapes, because grapes are the most important thing. They stand for a beautiful garden. And indeed, that's true for descriptions of paradise in those days, pretty much everywhere. But when talking about the heavenly paradise, the Quran strangely omits the regular word for grapes, which is really odd given the importance of grapes when describing a perfect garden. But if the hurin are the grapes, then it makes perfect sense. Not only does it talk about grapes in paradise to make it visual how perfect paradise will be, by using this term hurin, which describes grapes as crystalline and perfect, you also distinguish them from ordinary grapes on earth. So reading Mu'in as grapes makes perfect sense in this context as well. So what's the conclusion? We've just looked at one example here, the, the Huris. But of course, Luxembourg did the same thing with, with lots and lots of verses. A um, lot more of those verses about Huris, but also verses on entirely different topics. And Christoph Luxembourg could show that many passages in the Quran were actually written in Aramaic or excessively using Aramaic words, sometimes even entire sentences. And in every single case, he could make sense of the previously dark passages. Now, the example we just looked at actually isn't considered to be a dark passage. That's considered to be clear, even though there are some oddities there, both grammatically, as well as the fact that these women are described as white eyes. And in other parts, they're described as having translucent skin, for instance, which again is very odd for a human being, particularly if it's, that being is supposed to be um, extremely beautiful. But for a grape, that makes sense. If, if you have a perfect grape, then of course it has a translucent skin. But despite that, these passages about the Huris are typically regarded as clear, but particularly those dark passages, in every single instance, Luxembourg could make sense of them, could give a proper reading, which is understandable and makes sense in context. And I've mentioned before that he also goes very much into grammar a lot. And he argues that very often conjunctions, articles, and syntax can only be explained using Aramaic because the Quran otherwise simply has mistakes in, the, in it. It has grammatical constructions which are just not allowed in Arabic, but which would work in Aramaic. But there's even more than that. He also found scribal errors that can only be explained by the original document being written not only using Aramaic words, but actually written in an Aramaic script. Now, what he is saying here is not that the Quran was originally written in the Aramaic language necessarily. I mean, there are Aramaic words here. That's that's the whole point. Loan words or words that the speakers would have understood. But the majority of the Quran is still written in the Arabic language. However, what he's saying here is that the first Quranic manuscripts, they were written using the Aramaic script. So it was Arabic language with some Aramaic words in it, but using the Aramaic script. And it's also important to note that the Arabic script is actually quite recent. And we know before there was this Arabic script, Arabs wrote Arab texts using other scripts. We know of Arabic text using the Aramaic script. We know of Arab texts using the Greek script and also other scripts from that region, whatever the, the writers were familiar with, because there wasn't a common Arabic script. So they used whatever they knew best. Oftentimes it was Aramaic and what Luxembourg argues is that looking at some of these scribal errors it makes only sense if the original texts were written using an Aramaic script. One example he gives here is that in Aramaic the letters L and Ein are very similar looking 
whereas in Arabic, they look very different, which means that in an Aramaic script, the correct meaning can often only be inferred to from the context if somebody writes um, a bit sloppily, which means that when written in an Aramaic script, if the writer writes a bit sloppily, then it's difficult to distinguish between L and Ein, and it can only be done by looking at the context. But that's typically fairly easy to do. So if you see the word and you're not sure just by looking at the letter what it is, but if you look at the whole word, then it, you typically can only be one or the other. It's normally not a problem if you write a bit sloppily in that instance. As an analogy, imagine that I'm writing down the sentence, be my guest. Now I say I also write it a bit sloppily so that the letter G in the word guest could also be interpreted as a letter Q. If somebody's going to read this sentence, they typically will not have any problems inferring which letter I meant to write because be my guest, that's a common phrase and easily understandable. Now let's say a scribe comes along who is not well versed in the English language, but he can read and write the Latin alphabet and also the Greek alphabet. And he's tasked with transcribing my sentence into the Greek alphabet. So it's still an English sentence, but instead of the Latin alphabet, it's now going to be written in the Greek alphabet. Now the Greek letters for Q and G are very different. If that scribe now thinks that I've written a Q instead of a G and transcribes it into Greek and somebody else comes along who's well versed in English and who can also read Greek letters, he still won't be able to correctly interpret my sentence because the letters for Q and G are so different looking in Greek that he will not be able to make the connection to understand that I actually meant to write G. So now he will be reading, be my quest. And now the meaning of the sentence has been flipped on its head. And that's something that Luxembourg found in the Quran as well, proving that at least the part where this error occurred must have been written using the Aramaic script initially and was only later transcribed into Arabic. What's more, when taking Aramaic into account, the Quran can be fully understood as a Christian text. We find remnants of old Syrian liturgy. We find Christian descriptions of paradise. We found quotations of scripture, hymns, Christological greeds, and so on. So it's clearly a Christian text, but with one important difference, and that's their Christology. So while it is Christian, while they have a Christology, it's different from what's nowadays understood to be Christian. So nowadays, pretty much every Christian denomination is Trinitarian in nature, whereas the writers of the Quran, they were not Trinitarian. They rejected this idea of the Trinity. They believed Jesus only to be a man. Now, during the ninth century, Arabs began adding those diacritics, so those dots and squiggles, and thereby fixing the reading. Right? So now the meaning of every letter has been determined. But that was an interpretive act by Muslim Arabs, who were at this point no longer Christians and no longer spoke Aramaic. Very often they couldn't really understand anymore what was in front of them. And they didn't even know it. So they see this Arabic text and they had no idea that there could possibly be some Aramaic words in there because they, they weren't aware of that anymore. They didn't speak the language anymore. So they, they had to deal with what was there, which led to some creative positioning of the dots. Now, very often we hear that there is no problem with the placement of the dots because we have a long-standing oral tradition. Long before the Quran was even written down, there were lots and lots of Muslims who remembered it by heart, so there couldn't have been any errors um, when placing the dots. But of course, that is a fantasy, and it can be shown very easily because we actually do have different different Qurans. Again, it's something many people today don't know, because nowadays there is sort of a standardized version, the so-called Cairo Quran, but that was put in place in the 1920s, so fairly late. And even then it wasn't the standard, and even today actually it's not the standard, there are still other ver versions out there, it's just that they are now not very prominent anymore. But until the 20th century, there have been more than 30 different Quran versions. And that's also um, acknowledged in the standard Islamic tradition. Obviously, Muslims noticed the fact that they were using different Qurans and they rationalized it by saying, yeah, well, there are seven, seven different readings that were given to Muhammad, which reflected the dialects of their time. But really, when you look at it, that also, of course, doesn't make a whole lot of sense because those differences in those different Quran versions go beyond just different dialects, different pronunciations. There are entirely different words in there, different meanings based on the same characters, but with different dots, which can lead to a completely different understanding. And if there had been a oral tradition, there could realistically still be some differences, of course, 
if somebody mishears something or misremembers a word slightly, but the differences would be marginal and specifically they would sound very similar. But what we see in those different Quran versions that are out there is that the differences are sometimes um, quite significant. So for instance, in one tradition, we have a word which is pronounced as yayas and that same word in a different tradition is pronounced as yatabayan. So not only do they mean different things, they don't sound anything alike. So this cannot be the case of mishearing or misremembering a word. This can only be explained by different people putting the dots in different places. So they started with the text and not with an oral tradition. All right, that's it for today. Next time, we're going to look at the Quran once again. And if we can find any influences on the Quran from external traditions. Until then, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.